a pucker. I am so confused right now. Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. Spider-Man No Way Home is finally here and it's really great. But a few of you had lingering questions and plot holes that you asked about on my Twitter and our community page. So I'm going to explain Doctor Strange's spells, what happens to the villains, and why Venom was even in the movie at all. So let's get started. We had a lot of questions about the forgetting spell that ends the movie. Remember, Doctor Strange's original spell went haywire. Instead of making people forget that Peter is Spider-Man, it attracted people who knew his secret to the MCU from all across the multiverse. The solution was to make everyone forget who Peter Parker was so no one could remember that he was Spider-Man, because in a way, he never existed. Now the first question we had about this was why would Doctor Strange forget if he remembered casting the forgetting spell after the full moon party at Karmartage? I mean, that's simple. The Karmartage spell was to make everyone else forget, not Strange. But now, if anyone remembers Peter Parker at all, then people from all across the multiverse will be attracted to the MCU once again. So he had to make himself forget. But most questions we had were about the paper trail. Nino Black points out that the spell won't make Flash Thompson's book go away. Marcos Baez says, what would happen if someone watches a YouTube video about Peter being Spider-Man? Will they remember or will they know since that's the point? Or are they gonna forget again right after watching? So it is possible that Strange's spell did eliminate all physical evidence of Peter's existence. After all, he does a great job of just wiping people off the streets during this battle in Infinity War. But I don't think that's what happened here. The spell didn't change reality. It enchanted people's view of reality. Imagine that everything about Peter Parker has become sort of dim, like some unremarkable store on the street that you've never noticed before. And suddenly one day you go, wait, there's a hardware store there? How long has that been there? Why are they shutting down? I've never even noticed it before. In other words, whenever someone sees a reminder of Peter Parker, their mind just kind of automatically avoids it. Flash Thompson might remember that he wrote a book, but in the same way you might remember a short story about a pony that you wrote in third grade. I mean, you know that it's there, but you don't remember all the plot details about what little Acorn and her friend Buttercup did. J. Jonah Jameson would know that he rose to power by attacking Spider-Man, but not the details of his original bombshell story. But I'm not just making all this up. This is kind of how the forgetting spells work in Harry Potter. And this has actually happened in the comics more than once. For instance, the Sentry. He was one of the greatest heroes in the Marvel Universe. Best friends with Reed Richards, Doctor Strange, Spider-Man, the Hulk. Peter Parker even won a Pulitzer by taking a photo of him. But the Sentry was also, subconsciously, a villain called the Void, who was threatening reality. So Doctor Strange, Reed Richards, and everybody worked up a spell to make him forget and make the world forget that he was ever a hero. It's very similar to what happens in this movie. Afterwards, if someone starts to remember something that they shouldn't, they just think, oh, I'm not allowed to remember that, and then they go on with their lives. Peter Parker doesn't even remember winning that Pulitzer Prize. So if someone did come across evidence that Peter Parker was Spider-Man, they would just ignore it, not notice it, or think it was fake. I do think that there is still a paper trail. Like Peter would still have his birth certificate because at the end of the movie, MJ still has the Black Dahlia necklace that Peter gave her in Far From Home. She would remember that she got it in Europe, just not how she got it. Then Den Edits asked, how does everyone remember that there's a Spider-Man despite having their memory wiped about who Peter Parker is and well, everything about him? Well, People still remember Spider-Man, especially that he was blamed for Mysterio's death. They just don't remember Peter Parker. Kind of like how you may remember that there was a live action Superboy show in the 90s, but you can't remember the name of the actor who played him. Spider-Man and Peter Parker are basically two separate identities. Quentin Anderson asked, shouldn't Peter be able to simply tell Ned and MJ what happened and they'd at least know? In a world of aliens, wizards, and the blip, they'd be pretty amendable to that kind of explanation, especially if it was coming from Spider-Man himself. The reason Peter doesn't tell MJ and Ned the truth at the end of the movie has nothing to do with them believing him. I'm pretty sure he could just stick to the ceiling and they would believe anything he said. Now, it would be hard to rekindle his romance with MJ, but I mean, I'm sure they'd find a way to make it work. This was actually Peter's original plan, but he changes his mind when he sees the bandage on MJ's head. He doesn't want to see her get hurt, and when he sees that she and Ned got into MIT, it hits home for him that his friends are happy and better off without him. And actually, give me just a second here. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm taking pictures of the shopping receipt. What for? You gonna print it out and hang it up? No, why would I do that? Man, I don't know why humans do anything. No, I'm actually doing this for an app called Fetch Rewards. They're the sponsor of this video. Fetch is this super easy to use app where I can earn free rewards on literally anything I buy. Like when I have a receipt, I take a picture, and iron points. Then I can redeem those points for hundreds of different rewards, including Amazon and Visa gift cards. Oh, I guess you gotta shop at the big chain stores, the ones that get angry when you bring me in. Not always, this receipt's from a little department store down the road. You can also use e-receipts by connecting to your Amazon account, like 
I just earned a ton of points just from the holiday shopping that I've already been doing. Now, I like this app because it's fast. I was able to scan, redeem, and spend my points in just a few seconds. The whole process is really easy. It doesn't matter where the receipt is from, just scan it and go. You can earn points from anywhere, Amazon, restaurants, any retail store. Plus, there are tons of rewards options. Yes, there are the Amazon gift cards, but there's also things that I just want to try out, like a Dollar Shave Club kit. After all your holiday spending, Fetch Rewards is a great way to get a little bit of something back. So we have a special deal for Screen Crush fans. Download the app now with the link in the description and use the code Screen Crush to get 3,000 points when you scan your first receipt. Back to Spider-Man. We also had a few questions about Matt Murdock and Peter's legal troubles. How did Matt Murdock get him out of trouble with the cops? I think it's pretty obvious. There was no actual physical evidence linking Peter to a murder. There was the video that was doctored to show him ordering a drone strike, but I'm pretty sure they could check Edith's logs and see that that's not what happened. However, Happy Hogan and Stark Industries get into a lot of trouble, partly because they had an army of weaponized drones orbiting the Earth that they gave to a miner. The movie is careful to show the Department of Damage Control seizing Stark technology, because this means that Pepper and Stark Industries can't help Peter out. Now, I'm sure if Tony were alive, he could have just vouched for Peter, but there really are no superheroes left who know Peter very well at least not on Earth. This also explains why Pepper didn't just write Peter and his friends a, a letter of rec to MIT. Her reputation was being dragged through the mud as well. Other people asked why Peter stopped using Stark Tech at the end of the movie and went back to a cloth suit. Well, first of all, because it's awesome, but also maybe the Stark suits were too damaged to be repaired. Captain Erie says, Edith not helping. Well, yeah, of course Edith doesn't help. That Stark Tech was seized by the government. No one creates a suit of army around the world except Uncle Sam. More importantly, Peter has no way to repair the suits or to get new ones. Happy Hogan mostly knew Spider-Man as Peter Parker. I mean, Peter Parker is the kid that he gave the suit to. It's kind of like Peter not remembering that he won a Pulitzer Prize for taking a photo of the century in the comics. If Happy did remember giving Spider-Man a suit, then he would automatically connect this to him being Peter Parker because he thinks of him as Peter first. Uh, but at the end of the movie, Happy does say that he knows May through Spider-Man. And this is true, but it was a charity event where Spider-Man appeared, not necessarily linking him to being Peter Parker. There's going to be a lot of things that are sort of touch and go in what people remember and what they don't. Someone else asked, why doesn't Peter use his celebrity status, his superhero connections, or even the scrolls to clear his name? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, he does not know that scrolls exist. And why would they care that this kid is framed for murder? And like I said, he has no superhero friends on Earth. Oh, and speaking of Matt Murdock, a lot of people are asking if the Netflix shows are now officially in the MCU. My guess is, kind of. I don't know if we'll ever see a new season of Luke Cage, even though we really should, but Marvel can keep the parts about those shows that they like and ignore the rest. Kind of like how the world is now ignoring that Peter is Spider-Man. We also had a few random questions like this one from GoMan369. Otto Octavius turns good, then Electro blasts him. But in the last fight, Otto turns up and Electro trusts him. Why? Well, for one, Otto shows up fighting Spider-Man. It's not like he goes in guns a-blazing and fighting the villains. So, why not trust him? Electro probably thinks the cure didn't work because he underestimates the science skills of the spider guys. Daniel Bresford says, after everyone forgets Peter and he says goodbye to everyone, he swings off the Statue of Liberty to the city. Valid. If you've ever played a Spider-Man video game like the excellent Spider-Man 2, then you know how hard it is to get to and from the Statue of Liberty. But in this case, he could have grabbed onto a helicopter that's off screen. After all this damage, it makes sense that the police or news helicopters would come by to survey the wreckage. Someone else asked why the Stark suit is not impervious to paint. Good point, especially if it's nanotech. I think that nanotech probably could remove any paint if Peter actually knew how to use it to do that. But also, I don't think that the suit is damaged as nanotech at all. It's the one that he made in Far From Home. So it's not nanotech, and Peter wouldn't have even thought to have made it impervious to paint. I think it's just a smart cloth. If I'm wrong about this, tell me down in the comments. Jay Wynn John says, how do they make a cure for all the villains in a few minutes? Well, they actually explained this in the movie. Toby had been thinking about a cure for Norman for a long time. I mean, after all, Norman and Harry going insane is one of the worst things that ever happened in his life, and he'd be keen to correct it. And Andrew has already cured the lizard. So for the others, they were using a combination of advanced Stark tech, Wakanda, tech and the combined intelligence of Norman Osborn and three Peters Parker. I can buy that they could get this done in a few hours. As Samuel asks how Peter could control a Spider-Man body while in his astral form. Now, this was a pretty cool moment and I have a couple different explanations. One, that it's just pure instinct. His spider sense makes him react. We even see lines buzzing out of Peter's astral head, just like how his Peter tingle is visualized in the comics. And there's another weirder explanation from the comics. Spider-Man has spider sense because he's connected to this great web of the multiverse and so is every other Spider-Man in the multiverse. This web is a metaphysical object that spreads throughout existence, and Peter can feel tremors on it, kind of like how an actual spider feels an insect touching their web. David Andrews says that just one of Peter's punches should have caved in Norman Osborn's face. Peter wasn't holding back, and the guy can catch flying cars. Yeah, 
But Norman is also a superhuman, remember? I want to see the progress report on human performance enhancers. Well, we tried vapor inhalation with rodent subjects. They showed an 800% increase in strength. 800%. I'm sure that he has some degree of invulnerability. Even if he doesn't, this scene was cool and scary as hell, and I wouldn't have changed a thing. The last Guitar Hero asked how the nanotech worked on Doc's arms immediately. Well, it didn't work immediately. It took a while to assimilate. I mean, we actually see it happen in the movie. That's what nanotech is. Teeny tiny robots that bond with other machines. It's what they do. Lagging Vision asks about Sandman's heel turn. He had no reason not to cooperate with Peter or even fight him. But sure he did. He didn't know this guy. He has no reason to trust him. He barely trusted Peter in his reality. He just wants to get home and see his daughter. Why should he care if these other guys get cured? I just want my kids back. We also had a lot of questions about Doctor Strange, like how was Peter able to overpower magic? Well, he didn't overpower it, he outsmarted it. The movie Doctor Strange does a really good job of presenting magic logically. The sorcerers pull energy from other dimensions. Even the way Strange learns magic is very scientific. How did you get to reattach severed nerves and put a human spine back together bone by bone? Study and practice, years of it. A lot of people asked, why does Strange still have the Eye of Agamotto? Well, the Eye is still a powerful relic that just also happened to house the Time Stone. In the comic book, Agamotto is a mystical entity, and the Eye is just one of his relics that is not tied directly to the Time Stone. I'm sure the same is true in the MCU. A lot of people wanted to know how Ned could do magic so easily when Strange struggled with it. Well, Ned obviously has a gift for magic that most people don't. He says that his grandma told him that they have magic in their family. Strange struggled to learn magic because he tried to force it. You cannot beat a river into submission. While Ned is a super easygoing guy who just allows things to happen, like how he and Betty became an item so easily. We're boyfriend and girlfriend now. There are also questions about the spell that attracted the villains in the first place. Mainly that if it was attracting everyone who knew Peter was Spider-Man, then where was MJ? Or the Harry's Osborn? Were they wandering around like the Spider-Men were? I mean, maybe, but they're pretty clear in the movie that the spell is drawing people toward the universe slowly, but with increasingly more speed. So it would make sense if MJ and those others were going to show up in the big portal scene later on. Here's one. Why were Toby and Andrew pulled from different points in the timeline when their villains are pulled from much earlier points? So it gets weird when we talk about the multi and other dimensions because we have to talk about time travel in Avengers Endgame when they went back into the past to change an event it created a new tangent timeline and then in Loki we learned that timelines splinter off all the time sometimes because of a time traveler and other times because you were late for work so when you're looking at the entire multiverse time is a flat circle if you view it from above it's more like all of time exists at once so Doc Ock, Norman Osborn and the others were pulled away the moment they learned that Peter Parker was Spider-Man Peter Parker. As for the other Spider-Men, I'm guessing they were pulled from further up in the timeline because it was the same year, 2023, for them. The same year that it was in the MCU. This is the time when those timelines were aligned the closest. And a lot of people asked if the villains returned the moment they died, won't they die anyways? Well, not in the case of Norman Osborn because he wasn't taken from the moment of his death, but maybe in the case of Otto Octavius. But then again, he might find a way to stop his machine before it's too late. He might not even drown himself this time. Zaka and the characters asked, when the villains go home to their universe after being fixed, what happened? Happens. We've seen them die, and if they go back, that doesn't really change anything, and they still die. And if they don't die, how is the Green Goblin dead in Toby's sequels? So again, we're talking about the multiverse. Like Professor Hawk explained, changing the past doesn't change your future. If you travel to the past, that past becomes your future, and your former present becomes the past which can't now be changed by your new future. When those villains return to their own times, they are changed. They will now make different choices. They essentially become nexus beings like we saw in Loki. Every point they return to is now a nexus event, which will spawn a new timeline and a new universe. If it weren't for the events of Loki and the murder of He Who Remains, then none of this would have been possible. The TVA would have stepped in to prune Peter Parker as soon as he showed up on Bleecker Street. Now here is a big one that we got a lot. Wicko90 says, I don't think Electro ever knew Peter Parker was Spider-Man. And, he did not. At least, well, okay, at first I thought, oh, maybe this is like an Electro from a different point in time. Like maybe in the Amazing Universe, Electro eventually finds out his secret, but nope. He even says to Andrew in the movie, gee, I thought you'd be black, but wait. Does he say that because he just found out that Peter Parker was white? Or did he mean, oh, back before I found out who you were, I thought you'd be black. Here's what I think. This Electro is from a different point in the timeline. He's been changed. He doesn't have a comb over anymore. He's more confident. I think that he did learn that Spider-Man's real name was Peter Parker. Probably he was recruited to join the villain boy band being cooked up in Norman Osborn's basement. But he may have learned Peter Parker's name, but never saw his face. So to him, 
Peter Parker could still be a black guy. And finally, let's talk about Venom. Lots of questions about Venom, many of which we did answer in our Ending Explained video. But here we go again. Why didn't Venom do anything but go get drunk at a bar in Mexico? Because he was on vacation, and this version of Venom is a screw up. He even says, On my planet, I am kind of a loser, like you. This is the most venomous thing he could possibly do. Sitting around with Danny Rojas, just confused and getting blackout drunk. I loved it. But the real question is, why was Venom ever pulled to this reality? He doesn't know Peter's identity or that he even exists. But wait a minute, yes he does. In the Let There Be Carnage post credit scene, the symbiote says, 80 billion light years of hive knowledge across universes would explode your tiny little brain. The symbiote share a hive mind that spreads across universes, plural. That's the key word. The symbiote hive mind exists in the multiverse, across the multiverse. So, you remember Topher Grace's Venom? He is part of the symbiote hive mind. That version of Venom knew who Peter Parker was. So, in this post credit scene, Venom connects Eddie to the hive mind. Maybe Venom had even shut himself off from the hive mind after leaving his people. So the moment he reconnects to the hive, Venom learns that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, and this knowledge pulls him into the MCU. And when he sees Peter Parker, he even says, And then he promptly gets blackout drunk and listens to an MCU recap. He should have watched ours. It's only 15 minutes long. Well, if you have any more questions or plot holes, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.